Good day, uh, folks. This is uh, Matt Kieswetter with St. Andrew's Memorial Anglican Church in Kitchener and joined with uh, a, a good friend of, uh, of mine and, and Leslie's uh, Mark Loyal, who is, uh, is the priest at St. John the Baptist Anglican Church on Walpole Island and also Walpole Island uh, United Church. So thank you, Mark, for, for being with us. Thank you, Matt. It's great to see you. Um, we are good friends. The people out there, I've known Matt for quite a few years uh, before he was ordained and got to know him and Leslie. And so I'm honored to be his friend and honored to be here with him today and with you for this service. Well, thank you. And it, it was about probably around a year ago exactly that you joined us in our parish and deanery for a dinner and conversation as well. So we're kind of, maybe <laughs> yes. we've always done it this way. Yeah. This time of year, we always get together. Yes, yeah, that's good. Well, we, I've just got a, a handful of questions uh, that uh, uh, to, to, uh, to balance off of you and to get your, uh, your perspective um, and wisdom. And how about as we transition into the questions, I'll, I'll open us up with a little prayer here. Sure, yeah. yeah let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, dear Lord, but the faith of your church, and give to us and give to this world the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. So, Mark, um, one of the readings for today uh, comes from the prologue of the Gospel of John um, about the Word, the Logos. Uh, yeah. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I'm curious, why is this a fitting uh, Gospel for National Indigenous Day of Prayer? Um, in, in my opinion, my, I think what... Um I don't want to compare um, my experience or uh, the, or uh, that of indigenous people to, to Christ to say that we're like Christ, but but um, that darkness overcame. Uh, darkness was part of the the the, the relationship, not initially with uh, non-indigenous. Uh, people, the visitors that came to North America and all of that, but over time, and and uh, because of um, certain elements that weren't good for Native people, and and this isn't a blame game, and I'm not saying you know white people are bad or anything like that, but 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 what happened was that in order for Native people to, to continue to move forward as they have and as they are doing, uh, the darkness did not overcome it in the sense of the darkness of the experience of what's happened to our, our lives collectively as Indigenous people, the disadvantages, the racism, uh, the, the abuse, the residential schools, the alcoholism, uh, drug addiction, uh, diabetes, <laughs> all the, the list goes on and on and on. Well, the, the bottom line for me as Indigenous people, a person, and, and is, is that we are survivors. We, we, we're still here and we're still moving forward uh, in, in our communities and in our lives and with our families. And those who, who uh, and the, there are those who have had tremendous um, negative stories, yet over the years they've had positive impact on their community and in the world because they've overcome those that negative those negative stories and and so they're survivors. So that's what what comes to mind. The darkness did not overcome come it, and so for Indigenous people, whatever darkness was in our lives, it did not overcome it. Now we're still in some ways. So darkness is our challenge, but there is the hope, that, not the hope, but the reality that we are survivors and it will not overcome us. Now from that powerful scripture, uh, one of, I think it's 
just one of the most uh, powerful pieces of the gospel uh, to the collect of the day for, for this observance that talks about being rooted and grounded in God's covenant love. So from that amazing passage of scripture to that very concept of covenant is so prominent in scripture. Um, covenant has something to do with partnership or a pact, an agreement, a relationship between parties. Um, how is that concept of covenant important to Anglicans in Canada at, in the present moment, especially as we strive and hope and pray and work for a more just uh, and life-giving relationship between settler and indigenous peoples? Um, yeah, covenant for me on National Aboriginal Day Prayer, covenant is at the center of, of it. Um, because when we talk about National Aboriginal Day Prayers, it's not just praying with, praying for the natives, <laughs> but it's praying with one another and, and doing things like this with your, your church and parish and people. And, and, um, and so in a way we're entering into a covenant because uh, we're, 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 we're learning about each other and we're, we're, we're getting to know more about each other. So, in, in, and I think about that is what's bring, gonna bring healing and reconciliation. So that's what's central on this day is covenant, that we, we are to uh, be really committed to, you know, the past is the past, the future is the future. All we have is the present time to be committed to getting to know each other, getting along with each other, uh, commit to walking with each other, being in covenant, just like we choose each day to be in relationship with our significant other, our spouse, or our, our parents, our children. Uh, all those relationships are covenant. And of course, our covenant relationship with God is a covenant relationship. So I think the only way, uh, one of the most important ways forward in terms of relationship with between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people is covenant. That it's not just, okay, I'm gonna have lunch with you. It's, I agree, I, I wanna be in relationship. So let's walk together, let's eat together, let's get to know each other. So covenant is significant. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, dwelling with one another as the word came and dwelled with us is coming to mind as. Yeah. You know. Now, um, around this time last year was General Synod, so the, meet, the national meeting of, of the uh, Anglican Church of Canada, and a significant step there made towards uh, a, a self-determining Indigenous church within the Anglican Church of Canada. And um, Archbishop Mark McDonald that, uh, has described this as not a move away from the church, but a move to become more deeply involved in the church from an Indigenous perspective. So I'm wondering, do you have a sense of, of steps or progress that have been, has, has been made in the past year? And, and also maybe, can you give us some ideas of what this self-determining church might look like? Imagine, say, looking back 20 years, uh, if you zoom into the future, look back over 20 years, what might we see? Um, this is a, uh, a more, more diff a difficult question. I, I don't, um, I, we, we, had, we were scheduled for a visit from the Archbishop uh, at Easter, uh, and of course because of the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, we had to cancel that, that visit. Um, and I'm, I'm not a member of the Anglican Council of Indigenous People. We're also, we were to have uh, uh, what's called a sacred circle, which is a gathering of Native Anglicans from every diocese represent, representing their parishes and their communities and their diocese, and they come together. We're supposed to be in Aurelia in June, um, at this time actually. And, uh, we, and it's there that we kind of would have had a sense of where, where things have been from the last year at is Mark McDonald, after Mark McDonald was made the, an archbishop. So unfortunately, and not really being plugged in as a member of ASIP, not having had the experience of going to Sacred Circle, um, and not having had a visit 
which we're scheduled or, or to even have a conversation with him face to face. I can't, I do not have an answer to the first part of that question uh, as to, I, and I'm, I, and, but don't get me wrong, I, I'm sure uh, that, um, that there has been uh, um, progress. I think the significant progress in, in, in that whole process, what's important is that he's, uh, Mark is recognized as an, uh, an equal among uh, the archbishops, that he is not just, uh, because he's not a diocesan bishop. He wasn't a diocesan bishop. He could have been, he wasn't an honorary bishop, but he, he didn't have a jurisdiction or a power. And, 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 and he still, in a way, doesn't, but as, our, well, he does have as archbishop now, he's, he's equal to the primate. And, and again, it's, it's giving indigenous people equality, which leads to freedom, personal freedom and commun communal freedom. Uh, and so saying, yes, the, the indigenous people of our, of our church are that important that they should have their own uh, bishop, archbishop, equal to the primate of Canada, who is just as important. And, and so it's kind of that, that, that's the huge progress. And so I think our people, our Anglican indigenous people are very proud to have Mark made an archbishop, the people that know him, knew, know him and were connected to him. And the other, and and uh, and the other piece was that um, very proud, but also feeling like okay, we we too are significant because we have an archbishop uh, as the, to to represent uh, our communities and our our families and our lives. So so and Mark is uh, in tune with the, with the various communities. I know with me, he he tries to. Um, make schedule these visits. We had a visit with him uh, about two years ago uh, when I first started in this pair or over two years. I've been here about 24, 25 months, but uh, when I first started, he, he came. So that, that kind of, it doesn't really answer the question, but does in a way. <laughs> um, the, the, the second part of that question, looking 20 years ahead, I don't know. Uh, again, this question is hard to answer because at one point, 20 years ago, uh, when I I've been ordained uh, 27 years, and uh, over 25 years ago, when I was first ordained in, in the Anglican Council of Indigenous People, we thought having our own structures and our own freedom uh, to have our own ceremonies and all of that, and I thought. No, oh, that's great. But then you run into the dynamic of in various communities. And I've been in both native and non-native several parishes over my, my 27 years that the, there are a lot of native people that do, wouldn't want that ceremony. So it's not just a matter of say, okay, we're indigenous now, now we're gonna, you know, um, burn sweet grass and, and, and pray with our eagle feather. I think it's more complicated. What I would what I would like to see with the change in the twenty years from now is that the church is um, has a is a, a significant agent to their communities that they're they're bringing change in in terms of the great challenges that we face, uh, like the the lost youth. Um, homelessness, uh, the drug problem, uh, drug addiction, um, and the list goes on, uh, you know, lonely elders, uh, th things that, uh, which we, we, we struggle to do now, but we, we want to do, but it's kind of like, it's so difficult to engage. So I, I'd like to, I hope that my vision for 20 years is that the, the church it doesn't fade away, but that it's it's so plugged into the needs of the community that it's a positive agent of change, change of heart, change of lives, change of attitude for the Native community. Thank you. Now, the next um, thing, I'll preface it with a, a 
personal story came to mind is about around 20 years ago when I was doing my undergrad at Waterloo, um, I took a course from St. Jerome's College. It was called Evil. And I said, oh, I have to take that. Um, I thought I thought we were maybe going to study like uh, heavy metal album covers that I had <laughs> seen in my youth and like, oh, uh, what does this Motley Crue or Slayer cover say? But no, it wasn't that at all. It, it, it was not that in the least. What it was, was it was mostly about institutional and systemic evil or sin. So we talked about the Holocaust, racism, uh, and, and, uh, but also responses to that, like uh, liberation theology. So it was a, a, an introduction to worlds. Um, and so that concept of systemic sin or systemic injustice, institutional sin, um, is, is in the news more than ever I'm finding right now with uh with uh, horrible uh murders and tragedies that we've seen and in uh, on, on on our news screens um the there's a litany for healing and restoration that rupert's land used uh or wrote a few years ago it talks about unjust legal educational health and social structures that exist and prayers for change of those things. So what are some of the systemic injustices that are frequently faced by Indigenous folks today? Um, we, I think that they, 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 I thought of this when you gave me this question and I, I really had thought of it and I wanted to do justice to the question. Um, and the thing that came to mind was that people make comments to me, uh, 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 non-native people and, and people in this community. And when I say in this community, I live in Wallaceburg, which is 10 minutes from Walpole Island. And, um, and people make comments about Walpole Island and sometimes they don't know I'm native and I, I am native and I'm indigenous. And, um, and it's like they don't even know that they're racial comments, that they're racist. And we see this in the American news all the time. You, you get these, these, these big <laughs> racial comments coming out of the leaders of the country and then they're defending, saying, oh, they're not race, racist and all, all these people are defending them, saying, oh, they're not racist. Um, uh, uh, systemic injustices begin with the fact that there it, it, it ex race racism exists and when you don't acknowledge that it does exist and that it's there the danger is is that you can be racist making comments having attitudes at leading to actions which are racial and hurtful to people of other races um, and and we see that in the news with with the shoot to, you know recently with the, the police and the, and the black uh, gentleman in the states it, it's an ongoing thing like uh, because it comes from uh, it comes from a place where native people uh, have been regarded when the government had to deal with us when we were going to reside in the land together, the Canadian government didn't do very well. Uh, they, get, they get an F <laughs> in that, uh, is that they, 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 first of all, they put us in onto reserves and separated us and took the land that we, we were preferred and put us on other pieces of land that weren't the best and treated us and never referred to us as Canadians or as citizens. And so the Indian Act is uh, one of the most racial documents in our, his in our country's history. And people probably don't even know that. And it still is a racial document. And that's where, where systemic racism and injustice comes from. That it came from the fact that uh, the Canadian government treated native people as second class, not even as human, but as subhuman, as substandard, as secondary kind of citizens, not even citizens. We weren't really considered citizens to 19, till 1960. So my parents and my mother couldn't vote till 1960. 
so they were never equal citizens. So that's where, and people don't know that. And so that's where systemic racism comes from, the fact that it's accepted by the Canadian government. It became accepted by the Canadian people. And so, what, and, and it's just, oh, well, they're, they're, they're not thinking that they're, ra they're racial comments because uh, it's systemic. It, it's been the way it has been for at least 200 years. So if I've been alive 50, 60 years, it's, it's, it's just part of what, how we treat Native people. And I don't even think it's wrong because nobody's told me it's wrong. So an example of that, Matt, is um, uh, as you as your people may know that our, or uh, Walpole Island, the, the island, when the COVID broke out, uh, they, they shut down the island. So only residents and essential visitors and workers could, could come onto the island. <clears throat> and that's still the place, the case. Well, I've had somebody come up to me and, and, and I've heard this comment another time and they've said, well, why, why, why can't we go on there? But then those native people can come into Wallaceburg. We can't go there, but they should be kept out of Wallaceburg. And, and that's a very uh, systematic racial injustice in an unjust comment to, to assume that because they're native that their disease that if they contract COVID it's going to be sometime uh, five ten a hundred times worse than if a, a, a non-native person got it and again to assume that uh, they should be restricted to where they go they're equal and so this comment implies that really they're not equal they should go where we tell them and at one point in certain reserves of, around the country, it, the people were not allowed to leave their reserve without permission of the Indian agent or a government official. So a comment like that, I, I find truly offensive and, 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 it's, and racist. And it stems from uh, uh, systematic, uh, racial systematic, um, systematic racism. <laughs> so that's that's the answer to that question. Well, thank you. Now, um, as we're in this moment where people are increasingly aware of these things, and these things are not new. I mean, you're pointing that they're just uh, it's like par for the course of uh, decades and hundreds of years. Um, but for whatever reason, it seems like these things are having um, an impact that that you know something is is sticking and there is such a an outcry for change and lasting change and significant change like to the fabric of society and how we how we dwell with one another so um i'm finding online like a lot of people are asking for reading lists uh, you know who are the authors what are the the books so we can be educated people are protesting and marching uh, signing petitions and so there's this this response and in, in this like okay what can i do what can we do or what's you know if there's one thing we can do what is that uh so i mean i i guess i'm asking you for those that are are watching this video um if they have that question what is one concrete thing i can do uh or what are some things i can do can, at, can you share some? at the core of it matt is 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 uh worldview in order for true cultures to get along, we have to understand each other's worldview. So I have a worldview which is circular, which which uh, uses animals, which is which is very observatory, which relates to to Mother Earth, which uh, is 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 uh, Im important to uh, the, the the past and and, and ancestors history, that kind of thing. And that's not different. That's not to say other cultures don't have those pieces as well. But I, but I think you know, it's kind of like, where are you coming from? If I want to understand you, then I want to know, or if I want to be on 
relations with, with you or with anyone. It's you know, like, or if I say something or someone says to me, well, where are you coming from? Well, I think we come from our worldview right, that's been passed down uh, through our upbringing, through our culture, through all of that. And I, 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 for me, this is my answer to this question, that the best way to, to begin uh, in the one thing you do, there are, um, there are resources uh, I, would, I would suggest to, to find children's resources of Indigenous culture. So different books like Giving Thanks, uh, uh, traditional teachings, um, they're, they're, they're the, those, those great stories of the Raven, Indigenous stories of the Raven, or even um, in the stories, storybooks, like uh, 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 by Indigenous authors. Thomas King is one. Um, that, it will, it, it, because what they, they explain is they explain what the worldview. They explain, uh, yeah, they explain the teachings, but it's kind of, it, it, it talks about the worldview. So, so there is a book giving thanks. Uh, it's it's kind of just a, it has great native pictures on it, and it has like you know a sentence on each page, and it's what we give thanks for. Well, when you read that, you understand that Thanksgiving is a truly important part of native culture. And then you would go to say the next step would be oh well we'll go to some ceremony or some event and you get a gift and the gift is that because Thanksgiving is not just saying thanks but it's giving and and so that so that's a worldview that's very important that that's a, a foundational piece of my, of, of my when I say my culture my family and that's how I've been taught by my mother uh, and my father, but, but that's, and my grandparents, like that's, that's very important piece. So anyway, that, that's where, where I would, what I suggest, that's what came to mind. Uh, I mean, there's other things, writing the PM and absolutely do those things. But, but for me, it just begins in kind of the foundation of, of relationship is, is understanding each other and, and that, comes from knowing who, where are you coming from? <laughs> and, and that's kind of trying to understand each other or, or get knowledge of each other's worldview. And, and so the simple books of stories by indigenous authors or children's books about traditional teachings. And if you go online, that would be, you could find those kinds of things. Thank you, I, I really appreciate the uh... The, the tangible um, ideas uh, for us to, to look into. Now, as we come to a close of our time, um, I'm really curious if you would share one or two highlights. You said, is it 27 years of ordained ministry? So yeah. yep. in, in those 27 years, what, what are a couple powerful moments uh, for you as, as a priest and as a Christian? And as an ind indigenous person, okay. Um, I think I my yeah, my most uh, sacred um, experiences as a priest are the impact that I have on children in a positive way. In, in, in indigenous and non-indigenous communities. And I've been in both. I'm kind of split down the middle, just like my background, <laughs> and, and, uh, in, in, uh, and half in the different indigenous communities and half in non-indigenous communities. In both, I've had the great privilege to minister to children. And in both, I've had the, the, the privilege for them to say, you're significant. Um, and I, I shared this when we gathered as a deanery in Waterloo. Um, but, uh, you know, um, the, I, I, and it was two Easter's ago, I think here, or last Easter. And I did a children's story, a puppet with the puppet. <clears throat> and uh, I have a wolf and I have a bear and I <laughs> have a tiger. And anyway, and, and, uh, 
and when I did my puppet, uh, we we don't get a lot of children in the congregation, but this one girl, Kita, I, I actually baptized Kita when she was five. Well, Kita is now eight, and she's doing just fine. She lives with her great-grandmother, who's in her 80s, and uh, they're doing just great. And, and, and they're very special because I was part of that beginning. Well, she's been in the church before she was five, but I was kind of always in that I was able to baptize her. And I, I said to her once, I said, um, I, or she came into my office, there was some event going on and she said, oh, hi, do you remember me? You baptized me. And I said, yeah, I, I do. Do you? Do you, do you remember your baptism? She said, I remember my baptism every night when I pray. And uh, but she said, but sometimes I forget to pray. And I said, that's okay, I do too sometimes. And, uh, and so Kita uh, has held a very special place uh, as all of them, all the little impacts, because really that little piece, I think children, uh, are, are have the the key to to faith they know God they just innately we all as children did and when we kind of come of age we lose our innocence and we we, we unfortunately lose that so faith our and our Christianity is way back to that kind of sacredness of knowing God and so um so one Sunday morning at Easter Sunday, I did the thing, and I wished everybody happy Easter. And uh, and Kita um, came running down the aisle and just gave me a big hug in the middle of the service at, at the end of the service, and 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 that that meant a lot because it said that yeah, she she's an important part of of the Creator's plan, and and how important that my job as a pastor, as a minister, as a priest, to nurture those little souls. And, and the more I do and the more I'm connected, that that for me is, is the most sacred piece of, of being a priest. Um, and, and I'll just, uh, the other one is, um, and I was just talking to you, Matt, about this before we went recorded, <laughs> But about uh, now and with the COVID-19, um, I haven't been on, um, I haven't uh, been able to uh, uh, go online with my congregation because we don't have, a lot of people don't have computers, a lot of people, it's, it's, sometimes it's financial, other times it's just <laughs> the elders don't, don't want to be, and you probably have that in, in your church as well. And uh, so, I couldn't go on do anything online, but it was suggested that I go on our local radio station on Walpole Island. And, and so I, I've been on the radio uh, every Sunday and now twice a week at doing a Bible study on Wednesdays and a, a service on, on, on Sunday. And, and the impact that I'm finding that's having on people's lives, uh, church folk, non-church folk, Anglican United, elders, children, um, youth, uh, uh, people that don't go to church, um, it, it, it's really having a great impact. And it's just me talking <laughs> or singing. I sing a cappella, I sing three hymns on a Sunday. And, and but what, what's important is not, it's not me, I know, but it's the, the message in this time of our world and in every time of, kind of crisis we've needed and and i think we always need uh the, the messages of god which say god loves you god is with you you know there's hope and there's peace and you're not going to get lost and you're, you're going to get through this whatever you're going through you're going to get through this and you know what you're so so special to god and 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 just those basic messages that i preach are having such an impact and, and that gives me great hope because what it does is I know that God is that it, it, it affirms that God has called me to this ministry to all this ministry over these 27 years and is just continuing to to bless it and so so what's 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 for a 
priest is to see fruit. It's hard sometimes, Matt, you know this, we don't see fruit often. <laughs> sometimes, you know, we do, We pray for, we go, you know, we, we do our sermons and we visit the sick, but we don't always see, but to see that, to, to hear that, you know, uh, there's a, that um, 19 and 21 year old uh, youth are, are, are saying to their parents, oh, we gotta get home to hear Pastor Mark on the radio, that that message is making a difference. But again, it's not me, it's the fact that it's a message that God is God and God is, is love and God is power and God will help and God will guide and God will do incredible things in your life. You just let him. So anyway, that th those two events, um, it, most recently, I, I'm, I'm getting kind of old, so I can't remember the ones from about 20 years ago. I just kidding, I can't. But the, but the, the, the two most recent ones, uh, I, I've picked that they come from the island. Well, uh, you know, for me, one of the highlights of the last uh, several years uh, has been uh, what was or was that summer um, up in the Bruce Peninsula um, yeah. a couple of years before I was ordained, and and uh, for I know for Leslie as well that that was a highlight for both of us. Yeah. And our cat, who uh, said hi earlier, but I put it downstairs for it. But uh, it was, uh, I'm, you know, I'm so thankful to have uh, been your neighbor that summer and uh, and to yeah. be in that parish with you and to grow together now in in these yeah. ways. And and thank you for sharing about your uh, your valuing and your hope for relationship, for you know, authentic and loving relationship, and and for a, a future of mutuality and and respect. So thank you for your time today. Well, thank you, Matt. It was great to be with you and, and with your your folks, and I wish you all well out there <laughs> listening. Well, thank you, and, and same to you and to the, the, the churches that you serve. And now, I don't know if you want to sing a song or say a prayer, but you want to close us out with something. Sure, I'll, I'll close with uh, this prayer. It's a colic, uh, the covenant in, in 94, the Indigenous Anglicans met together representatives of congregations of indigenous Anglicans across the country, met together uh, in, in, in April 23rd to 26th uh, in 1994 in Winnipeg. And, and they, they had, a, they had a, a revelation, uh, the spirit moved in, in the midst of them and they identified their, all of their, their plight in their trouble in their communities, the alcoholism and the drug addiction and the, and, and their, the impact of residential school. And so they, they named that. And then they also identified by the, the, under, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And this was, a, 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 I was there, a part of that. I was a very young man, but I was there. And uh, they also identified that um, w w in order to heal ourselves and heal our communities and for God the creator to heal us, we need to be affirming of our who we are, where we've been. Some of it hasn't been good, but where we're going. And, and, uh, and we need to be um, uh, uh, um, self-determining in our communities and have the freedom to determine what our communities under the Anglican Church or in the Anglican Church of Canada will look like and have the freedom to experiment with worship, with liturgy, uh, in order to free ourselves as Indigenous people from the oppressive past and to help free our people from the, the struggles that they have. So, the, so out of that came a covenant of self-determination and that was in 94 and it, they, they wrote a document and then they offered that document to the National Anglican um, Council of uh, uh, General Synod. And, and so that's a historic piece of the Anglican people. Um, and like I said, I was there and I was honored to be there and be a signer of the covenant. Everybody there signed it. So the prayer I'd like to close with <clears throat> is to call it from, from that covenant. And uh, it just defines us that, like Matt had asked the question about 
<clears throat> about covenant, what the significance of covenant is uh, in indigenous, non-indigenous relations. So, so I thought it's in, thought important to uh, close this with the, the, the covenant uh, prayer. Creator God, <clears throat> from you every family in heaven and on earth. Sorry, <laughs> can't read it. I gotta start again. This is how old I'm getting. I couldn't see it. <laughs> Cre Creator God, from you every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. You have rooted and grounded us in your covenant love, and empowered by your spirit to speak the truth in love, and to walk in your way towards justice and holiness. Mercifully grant that your people journeying together in partnership may be strengthened and guided to help one another to grow into the full stature of Christ, who is our light and our life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Matt. All right, peace to you this day and in the days to come. And to you.